Welcome to the Register's Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds for Plymouth County. This show is about Plymouth County real estate. We're sh taping this show in January, but we're going to be reporting the numbers from December, and in fact, all of 2019 on this show, as this is a summary of our last year of recordings. Our headline for the month was Good year for the Plymouth County Marketplace. So let's go right to our numbers. The first image you're going to see is of deeds, deeds of sales of property. So for um, December, there were 854 deeds recorded, less than the 877 in November, more than last year's 808, uh, down 5% for the whole year. Um, I think um, uh, our activity shifted from sales to mortgages based on low interest rates, although there still were a lot of sales in Plymouth County um, in 2019. You're going to see a listing of sales as the next image from all of the 27 communities in Plymouth County. Uh, you'll see a listing by each of our communities, Plymouth being the largest number of sales, Brockton being second, but every one of our communities contributed on the far right column, as you can see, a lot of sales activities. Uh, next, you're going to see an image of mortgages. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, mortgages were really um, high. Uh, in 2019, there were 2,407 mortgages recorded in December, more than the uh, 2,294 in November, up 79% compared to last December. And for the full calendar year, uh, they were up 22%. Low interest rates have really driven the marketplace. People take out mortgages to purchase properties, but a lot of people took out mortgages to refinance the mortgages at lower rates to save money. And I think we're continuing to see that. Next, you're going to see foreclosure deeds. Uh, we've always tracked foreclosures since the crisis in 2008. They're still very low. 24 foreclosure deeds in December, less than the 26 in November, 45% less than last November. And for the 12 months of the calendar year 19, 44% lower. Next, you're going to see an image of foreclosure notices. A foreclosure notice is the start of a problem for someone, usually for a failure to pay, based on uh, uh, medical issues, loss of jobs. There were 63 foreclosure notices in December, less than the 86 in November, but down 16% over the last 12 months. Uh, and next, you're going to see an image of foreclosures by community. And as you can see, each and every community in Plymouth County has had some issue, whether it be a foreclosure deed when they'd lost the property to a lender or an order of notice when someone is in trouble. And you can see in the case of Brockton and Plymouth, the highest order of notices with Weeham being third and then uh, correspondingly based on the side of the size of the communities, foreclosure deeds. So we're e-recording in land court. Our next training room session will be held on February 6th. We run a free online training session at our main office in Plymouth. Give a call if you're interested, because the space is limited, but it's a hands-on training. And we have released the first phase of our transcriptions. So beginning in 1686, you can pull up a deed. The index information will be there. You'll see an image of the handwriting from when the document was first recorded. You can click a button and see a transcription of it. And uh, there are a lot of people not learning how to read cursive anymore. So this is going to be very important going forward. And I guess in the next segment is attorney Bill Sims of Sims and Sims Law Office, who will discuss the current status of real estate in the role of a closing attorney in a closing. 
So we'll see you in the next segment. Welcome back to the Registers Report. My name is John Buckley. I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. In this segment of the show, we always do something educational in nature. We've had commercial real estate brokers, appraisers, assessors, many realtors, um, and a lot of people involved in the real estate community, in the real estate process. And I have a great guest with me today, Attorney Bill Sims of Sims & Sims Law Office. Welcome, John. Bill. Thank you, John. Pleasure. Thanks for um, having me. And um, Attorney Sims has been a longtime attorney who's very involved in the real estate community. And i um, just like to have you tell our viewers a little bit of how you got into this business, for starters. You're talking about the, the legal profession? The legal profession. Well, believe a it. A wondrous legal profession. Yeah, it, it is. It is yeah. quite that. Um, I got to be honest with you, you know, when I was in college, uh, I bounced around through. Ham Hamilton College? No, Syracuse. Oh, Syracuse. Syracuse. Oh, yeah. Sorry. yeah, my middle son did go to Hamilton. Oh, okay, all right. Um, all right. But I bounced around from a number of different majors and courses of study and, um, and actually ended up graduating with a degree in communications. Took some time off um, after school and kicked around. Uh, one of my jobs was a uh, part-time uh, paralegal, a law clerk for a firm in Boston. Sort of got a little bit of the bug there, and as much as my father um, attempted to dissuade me from going into the profession, <laughs> he wanted me to make the decision on my own. Sure. He didn't want to influence me in any way, so sure. um, I decided uh, after that year um, to apply to law school, and the rest of the guess, is sort of history. So. Your father certainly was a well-known attorney, did a lot of presentations. I remember he did. watching him once on the stage at Massasoit. Yeah, he used to do quite a bit of that. I think he um, he did a lot of lectures for uh, SCORE, the uh, Service Corps of Retired exactly. Executives. Exactly, that was yeah. when I saw him. Yeah, he yeah. did a lot of that uh, um, community education stuff, yeah. And he was also the mayor of Brockton? Served uh, served two terms back in the 60s, yeah. Wow, that's great yeah. community service. Yeah. So let's tell our viewers a little bit about your firm. Um, it's on Arlington Street here in Brockton. We have, uh, we have two offices, John. We have the, uh, the main office here in Brockton on Arlington Street, which we've been in oh, probably oh, almost 20 years now. And uh, we have another office in Plymouth, um, which is where I live. So I uh, sort of split my time between the two, but uh, the main office is here in Brockton, so I spend a good chunk of my time here. Yeah, and I know in our next segment, a little bit of our history, one of our notable records is of Dewey Stone, who was um, very important in the foundation of the state of Israel, and he lived uh, in, in what is now your office. Yeah, that's right, John. The uh, the office was Dewey Stone's uh, uh, primary residence, and I'm sure you'll get into his history um, mm -hmm. in that next segment. But uh, yeah, quite a man and uh, a, a very historical figure in the city, of, right. and as well as uh, nationally too. So let, let's talk a little bit about um, what happens uh, and how a lawyer in his office or her office gets involved in a closing, um, the, the process by which you get notified and the steps you take t to prepare for that. So there are a number of different uh, means by which, uh, you know, an attorney like myself um, who's practicing in the real estate world um, may become retained. Um, some of the simpler ones and more straightforward um, is when somebody who is selling a house contacts me to represent them in the sale of the, of the house. Um, other than that, um, the more traditional or the more common um, uh, role for an attorney in a real estate transaction is when he represents the lender um, who's financing the purchase for the buyer. And uh, we often get notified um, by the lender directly in advance of uh, any potential closing. Sometimes we'll get called by the buyer um, who's asked if they want to pick an attorney off an approved list by mm -hmm. the bank that they're financing through. And the buyer will then call and we'll assist them with the, uh, the purchase and sale agreement, uh, negotiating terms of that. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about the importance of that. I want to make sure our viewers understand how important that is for the whole process, the early stages of, of a, a written document called the purchase and sales agreement. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, John. Um, you know, it really starts way before the purchase and sale agreement. Um, it starts really with the offer. 
And um, I don't know if the viewers are aware of it, but the actual offer document, uh, as long as it contains the essential terms, um, has been deemed by the courts to be a legally binding contract, even if the parties never get to that purchase and sale agreement, that offer can be enforced. Um, so that's really important to know, and I suggest that, you know, people get their attorneys involved as early in the process as possible. Don't, don't just call when there's a problem or when, you know, when things are going sideways in the middle of a transaction. Um, we can often stem those pro problems by making sure that uh, anything that requires a signature is understood by all the parties and um, everybody's on the same page in terms of understanding dates and timelines and those kind of things. One of the more interesting um, cases um, in the last couple of years, um, well, with the evolution of technology and the involvement. It's amazing to me how fast that all moves now. Yeah, and it's, um, it's become such an integral part of life in you know, business and particularly in real estate. There are so many email communications. Documents are sent by email and um, text messages. Mm -hmm. So there was, a, there was a recent case where the, I won't bore you with the too many details, but essentially the court concluded that if the essential terms of a real estate transaction are transmitted by a text message or an email, even by the agents on behalf of the parties, it can form the basis of a legally binding contract and be enforceable. Now that wasn't the case 10 years ago, I, probably not even five years ago, I, I, but that's how much technology um, is, uh, is, is playing a role in real estate scary. transactions. It is, yeah. it is. So you gotta really be careful what, what you're sending before you hit that send button on, you know, on a text message or an email. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then you get to the purchase and sale of the p &S stage and you help, you help with that. Right, so we typically um, will assist uh, the buyer. Um, if we're representing the lender, we'll also um, assist the buyer with the purchase and sale negotiations and um, make sure that the buyer is aware of the various contingencies in the in the contract. Most importantly, you know, there are a couple of outs if they need it. Um, one is typically the inspection, which often happens at the offer stage, but sometimes it gets pushed into the purchase and sale agreement. Mm -hmm. So the buyer has to be satisfied with the results of his home inspection, a very important uh, component of the transaction. And then once the inspection passes, uh, the buyer typically advances his loan application and, um, and we wait for the commitment from the lender, hopefully with not too many conditions on it. So we make sure that we build into the purchase and sale agreement an adequate um, financing contingency clause, which says that you know, in the event that the buyer's denied financing or is provided financing on terms they just can't meet, um, you know, they're, on some government loans, they require a number of uh, repairs being made to the property, things like that. And if it's just cost prohibitive for the parties, then the buyer, if he notifies the seller by the certain date, um, you know, can escape the contract, get his um, deposit back. Yeah, that, that's a key point, getting the deposit back. That's what it's all about. Yeah, usually, you know, the buyer's putting it down somewhere around 5% of the purchase price as a deposit. And it's clearly at risk if, you, mm -hmm. um, if you're not paying attention to the um, to the terms of your contract, dates, and, and, those, and those sort of things. Yeah, because all along the line at that stage, you know, the, the sellers of a house are, uh, you know, moving on to their next level and the transactions exactly. that interrelate with a lot of different parties. Sure, and um, we see these, uh, these, you know, the domino effect all the sure. time. You know, the seller is selling, but he's buying something else, and that person's probably buying something else. Right. And so, you know, you got to have some sort of contingency, I tell people, just in case one of these deals does not come together mm -hmm. timely. You know, um, where can you go if your buyer still wants to buy, but your house isn't available on the day you need it? Do you have a place you can go, you know, so you can keep your deal together and not default on your end of the deal? You know, there are a lot of them where they're, um, you know, subject to or conditioned upon the next deal and the next one after that. Um, it can get a little dicey, especially at the end of the month, as you know, when sure. volume crazy, clear yeah. picks up. Yeah. And I feel bad for people that are waiting at a, at a closing for funding. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing. So, uh, you know, we, we cannot, um, we, we can close and have people sign all the loan documents. We can't go to record with them until we actually have those funds in our account. And, it's, um, and, it, and they're wired these days, um, which another thing we have to be super careful of these days sure. is, is cyber theft, you know. Right. It's, um, we're Let, getting- Let's back up a little bit and go, um, what kind of notifications you work with the um, buyer representing the lender prior to the closing? You have to give them certain notifications by uh, document um, of like statements of what the cost will be and all that. 
Yeah, so that's usually provided by the lender, John. <clears throat> um, they'll give them what they call a, a preliminary closing disclosure. Okay. And uh, under the new TRID regulations, um, at least three business days prior to closing, the buyer actually has to sign electronically for that, seeing all of the costs involved. Mm -hmm. They're given it at the outset too, and that's yeah. a sort of a, an estimate. When they think there's a 10% tolerance from the time of that disclosure, that where that it, certain certain items can go up, but but by no more than I, th I think 10% overall. Um, so it's. So TRID, as much as it sort of scared people, um, it really uh, does prepare the buyer so mm -hmm. much more for the closing. When they come to the closing, they, they see their numbers right in front of them and they say, oh yes, I've been over this with my loan officer, I, I, I read it online, you know, and so they're prepared. It's not walking into a closing and someone had told them, oh, bring a check for $24,000 and here's, here's where that money's going. If they come in, they know exactly what's going on now. Oh, well, you know, that, that is certainly the best way I can tell you that we still get walk-ins to our closing rooms yeah and the, the worst thing in the world is when people start challenging the numbers at the closing table nothing worse very uncomfortable for a lot of people right. and right. um yeah and there are you know there's sometimes where people are unrepresented um and uh it's probably the one thing if i had to caution anybody um about anything that we talk about today the one thing is uh Real estate purchases and, and sales, for that matter, are not for the DIYers. You know, right. this is not something you want to just jump into casually and, right. and think you can wing it on your own. Um, you really need good qualified counsel um, to really understand all the consequences and exactly what you're doing, whether you're on this side of the table or the other. So we get to closing day. Why don't you walk our viewers what they would experience when they come into the registry or? Sure. Their office to yeah, we close in a, a number of locations. Um, uh, the registry is often very convenient. Uh, mm -hmm. um, the uh, both registries, Brockton and Plymouth, have great closing rooms mm -hmm. and uh, very comfortable um, for the parties. So everybody is typically rehearsed well in advance. They are informed. We send out um, extra copies of the closing disclosure to both buyer and seller to make sure that their numbers are accurate. Mm -hmm. um, on the buyer's side, you know, again, they're coming in with with funds that have either been delivered it in a treasurer's check or certified mm -hmm. funds, or sometimes they'll actually have them wired into our uh, escrow or mm -hmm. IELTA account. Um, and the seller will know exactly what their funds are going to be like, and oftentimes, you know, they will either get one of our IELTA checks or they will request that a wire be um, sent to um, either their bank account or sometimes if they're buying right afterwards to the other attorney's um, escrow account so that their funds are ready to go for their purchase. And, um, you know, there's a number of documents that get signed. The brokers are typically present because they deliver things like the smoke detector certificate showing the properties in compliance with the smoke detector and carbon monoxide uh, detector law. Um, and they're there as, you know, uh, to accompany their respective parties, buyer and seller, and uh, make the process, you know, somewhat more comfortable and, and easy and, uh, you know. Um, and then it's uh, myself, and sometimes if there is another attorney involved, they're there. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you'll have a loan officer who's been involved with their uh, borrower from day one to tender closing, mm -hmm. answer any questions that might pop up. Um, documents get signed. Uh, we check with, the, um, with my bank to make sure that the funds are in the bank, and if all's good, after everything's signed, we go to record, go down to the re recorder's desk, submit everything for recording, and assuming that everything is properly notarized and, and meets all the requirements of the Registry of Deeds. We go to record and come back upstairs, shake hands, and congratulate everybody. And everyone's happy in those situations. Yeah, yeah, I'd say, you know, it's the rare, it's the yeah, rare situation right, where someone, right. you know, is, is kicking or screaming or, and you know. We've, we've gone through a number of good years now when we have happy people at the registry. During that meltdown in 2003, there was some real difficult uh, Yeah, followed by, exactly, yeah, that. yeah, foreclosures and bankruptcies and so all sorts of yeah, ugly things that yeah. happened back then. So let's talk a little bit about uh, title insurance. Sure. And at what stage people get notified of their uh, right to choose and how you view the whole title insurance process. Yeah, good question. Um, so I, I think that when the, um, when the lenders typically prepare the closing disclosure, um, they are often given um, our figures at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we always include in there optional title insurance because mm -hmm. they are not required to buy title insurance for themselves. Right. They are required to buy a policy for the bank. And so that's when we'll often get a call from a potential borrower. Hey, can you explain this title insurance right. to me? And um, you know, so that's when we discuss it with them. Um, the loan officers always defer those questions to the attorneys. Typically, they don't, right. they're not salespeople, they're not attorneys, and you know, they don't want to start misspeaking and giving out bad information. Um, so uh, we get those calls, and I would say 
98% of everybody that I discuss and explain the policy sure. to them purchase it. You know, it's a yeah. one-time payment. Um, it's peace of mind. Um, and you can't guarantee, you know, even though I do a title search, right. I look at it, um, mistakes happen, things get misindexed. State um, issues that weren't done Yeah, properly, any, yeah. any kind of things that could get missed by my right. examiner, by myself, by right. any number of people. And yeah. um, the title insurance is, you know, is, is your one, um, one place to go in, in the event of a, uh, uh, a title defect. I know that when I'm looking at a title and um, I come across a potential issue, the first thing I do is contact the seller and ask them if they have a title insurance right. policy. Right. And that's the, that's the easiest recourse to keep a track on yeah. deal is to have that policy. I think uh, the advice that attorneys give on title insurance is invaluable. Totally. It, be, yeah. be, the, the cost of the title insurance owner's policy compared to what you could face in difficulty despite everyone's best work and best intentions is absolutely the way people should go. Oh yeah, it is. Um, and as your loan gets paid off, you know, you have left less coverage on the loan, so you're more, more at risk yourself. Yeah, and the policy um, that, that they write now is actually with a built-in inflation rider. So as the value of the property goes up, the value of the policy goes up. And it's always written for at least the purchase price. And um, built-in inflation riders, and also um, they have after-acquired coverage too. So if, if you yourself, you know, refinance, for example, and the lender that you pay off sends an incorrect discharge and you don't realize it until years later, mm -hmm. that policy will often cover you if you All buy right. an enhanced policy. So let's take a moment to share your contact information with our viewers. So um, my, uh, my physical office address, John, as you know, is uh, here in Brockton, 53 Arlington Street. Um, we have a website, simsandsimsllp.com, which people can reach us at. Uh, my phone number is local number, 508-588-6900, and we've had that uh, forever. And you said you have a second site for those towns watching this from far away? We do. We have an office at uh, 18 Main Street Extension in Plymouth, which right. is right downtown, right. and uh, often there, and we have a local phone number there, too, which is 508-747-4108. So in the last couple of minutes, break out your crystal ball. We've had a pretty good run at real estate for probably 10 years now. Yeah, I'd say it's been a solid 10 years. Yeah. And, and how do you see us going into through the winter into the spring? Well, they've been telling me for, uh, <laughs> for the last three years now that there's going to be a dip. There's right. going to be a correction. Something's going to happen. The good times aren't going to continue. So I've been, I've been that. hearing that for year after yeah. year after year. Um, I can just tell you that from what I'm seeing out there, um, you know, the numbers are strong. Interest rates are still good. Um, the biggest problem um, we're having right now is lack of inventory. Right. You talk to any right. of the realtors, they're going to tell Anytime you. Anytime we get a real yeah. realtor on, it's the Just first not enough. Plenty of buyers, say. just not enough stuff to sell them. Right. So, um, you know, as long as that, I think, is the biggest problem, I think the, uh, the market will stay strong for some time to go. I mean, we're going into the typical quieter months in the winter, but right. I'll tell you, we're, we're as busy as we ever are. Oh, as always, great to see you. My pleasure, John. Thanks and for you. having me. Welcome back to the Registers Report. Again, my name is... John Buckley, I'm the Register of Deeds of Plymouth County. Um, I want to thank Bill Sims for the great job he did describing the role of a closing attorney, um, whether it be representing buyers, sellers, lenders, and the various uh, procedures that people go through to protect them, including um, office to purchase and uh, purchase and sales agreement. In this segment of the show, we always do something of our great Plymouth County history. Um, January 1st was New Year's Day, the 7th Orthodox Christmas, the 19th National Popcorn Day, Martin Luther King Day on the 20th, the Chinese New Year will be coming up on the 25th, National Hot, Hot Chocolate Day on the 31st, and we have some, gr some great uh, uh, county and colony history to talk about. First one I wanna show you is a new one our collection, Griff, Griffin's Dairy in Abington. For generations, Griffin's Dairy was a family-owned dairy farm. Uh, the cows processed milk for delivery every morning. Uh, the farm was purchased in 1925 by Lawrence and Annie Griffin, and she was an Irish immigrant. They raised six children on a working farm uh, and for years, uh, they, hand, they delivered by truck to homes throughout the Abington area. Um, 
milk and other dairy products, a sign of a different era. So now the Griffin's Dairy is owned by the town of Abington. It was purchased at Abington Town Meeting in 1988 uh, and is now owned as Griffin's Farm Park and is a multiple use property with community gardens and other farming activity. And it's been the recipient of Abington Community Preservation Fund. It's a reminder of the days when Abington was a more rural town. So the next image you're gonna see is of um, called Silent Spring. Um, this was brought forward by a friend of mine who's an environmental attorney. There's a piece of property in Duxbury that was the site uh, of an event that happened that basically showed the impact of DDT uh, on, on wildlife and on birds in particular. And they, they were friends of a writer uh, by the name of Rachel Carson. And she wrote a book about the environmental movement and the damage being done by chemicals across the world. It led to the ban of DDT. Uh, her book, Silent Spring, um, which at the time was very controversial, is a book that is looked at in most environmental studies as an important introduction to understanding what we're doing here as a nation and across the world to protect our environment. Uh, many people credit Rachel Carson's book for the impetus on the uh, creation of the Environmental Protection Agency in today's climate change debate. And next, um, related to our guest today, Bill Sims, is an individual who lived in Brockton by the name of Dewey Stone. He was a Brockton industrialist and philanthropist who assisted in the founding of the nation of Israel. He was born in 1900 in Brockton, a leader of the Brockton and Jewish community, got his business degree at BU. They were involved in the Converse Rubber Company, but his role in funding the refugee ship Exodus to bring Holocaust survivors from France to Palestine was very important in the founding of the State of Israel. In his relationship with President Truman's former business partner during the 47-48 United Nations debate it was a crucial part of the creation of Italy. And a lot of it happened right at his home on Arlington Street, which is now the site of the Sims and Sims Law Office. He was a founder of the Weizmann Institute of Science and the Stone Science Building at BU is named after him and his brother, Harry Stone. Uh, so as we enter into the calendar year 2020, we're also getting ready for a big celebration on Plymouth Colony. Plymouth Colony extended from the Brockton area all the way to Tiverton, Rhode Island, and certainly down to Plymouth where the colonists arrived. Uh, this particular document we're showing today was the first deed in the handwriting of William Bradford that laid out the original land assigned to the colonists. You can see a transcription of it and a copy of the writing of, uh, of William Bradford, the second colonial governor. We'll be talking a lot more about our colonial history as we get into the year. I want to thank Lorna Green Baker and Christine Riches from my office for helping me put this show together. Mike Simmons from Brockton Cable Access for helping me put this show together. And we will share this information with many local ca cable access providers. <clears throat> I have in front of me um, a, a honorarium I received here from Brockton Cable Access for my 100th show. This is actually me, my 111th show here in Brockton Cable Access. Every month we take our numbers, bring in a guest, and talk about some of our great Plymouth County and Colony history. And I want to thank uh, very much Brockton Cable Access for me, allowing me in, in our office to share this information and share for what most people is their most valuable asset. So we hope you have a good start of the new year. Uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you.